Welcome to The World This Week, a weekly series where policymakers address the problems and promise of our world and how they're likely to affect you. I'm Frank Gaffney. This week, the issue is the Holocaust remembered, its lessons unlearned. Among the most odious developments of the 20th century has been the emergence of the practice of genocide deadly state-sponsored campaigns aimed at annihilating whole peoples. Germany under Adolf Hitler first applied modern technology, governmental administration, and logistics to such a heinous purpose. As part of the Third Reich's final solution of the so-called Jewish problem, the campaign to eradicate the Jewish people was carried out methodically throughout Europe. The world found numerous excuses, first for not opposing Hitler and then for not aiding or rescuing his victims. Appeasement remained official policy long after Hitler's extremism showed he could not be appeased. Refugees were refused asylum. Deliberate decisions were made not to bomb the rail lines carrying Hitler's victims to the death camps. As a result, more than six million Jews and many others perish. When the full magnitude of the Holocaust was revealed at war's end, a common refrain became, never again. Beyond punishing the perpetrators of this atrocity, two signal steps were taken. First, in 1948, the State of Israel was founded to serve as a permanent homeland and safe haven for the Jews. And second, in 1949, the United Nations adopted a convention which obliged member states to prevent acts of genocide and other crimes against humanity. Even so, peoples around the world are still being subjected to ethnic cleansing and death from state-sponsored starvation, exposure, and other techniques of mass destruction. In recent years, genocide has occurred from Bosnia to Sudan, to Iraq, to Tibet, to Cambodia, and Israelis continue to face the threat of annihilation from states like Saddam Hussein's Iraq and fanatical Islamic extremists. What are the lessons the world should have learned from the Holocaust? How might those lessons be applied today as new acts of genocide are perpetrated from Bosnia to Baghdad, from Khartoum to Cambodia? And in particular, what lessons should be drawn from this experience by Israel, the nation created to assure that the Jewish people never again face annihilation, and by her friends? To answer these and other questions, we have three distinguished guests with considerable experience in the defense of freedom and human rights. Former U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations, Jean Kirkpatrick the chairman of the U.S. House of Representatives Subcommittee on International Security, International Organizations, and Human Rights, Congressman Tom Lantos, Democrat from California, and Paula Dobriansky, a former Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Human Rights and Associate Director of the U.S. Information Agency. Congressman Lantos, as a survivor of the Holocaust yourself, might I ask you to begin by giving us a concept or an understanding of what it seemed like to those on the ground as you were in Hungary as the Nazi campaign of isolation, deportation, and ultimately elimination of the Jews proceeded. Did you feel, for example, that you were abandoned by the West? Well, I think it's obvious that none of us fully comprehended the nature, the scope, the intensity, the horror of the Holocaust. I was a 16-year-old boy, a uh, member of the anti-Nazi underground, doing my own little bit to fight them. Uh, but I think it's probably fair to say that the one enormous difference between 1993 and 1944 is that the eyes of the world are now there. The horror in Bosnia comes into our living rooms every single day. The nightmare in Somalia comes into our living rooms every single day. And I would like to hope and think that had there been equal, simultaneous global awareness that six million human beings, including a million children, 
were systematically being killed, the world perhaps would have reacted more strongly. I am not sure, because I think uh, as, I, as I look at uh, ethnic cleansing 1993 variety, uh, it's clear to me that the veneer of civilization is so thin and it hasn't grown any thicker uh, in these 50 years. There is a greater awareness of human rights. There is a greater awareness that, uh, that countries, powerful military alliances must act. But there is a lack of political will. And on, appeasement, on appeasement is as counterproductive in 1993 as it was in the 1930s. I want to come back in our discussion to the current phenomenon of genocide. But Jean, was it merely a matter of lack of information or did the West during the Holocaust, uh, the civilized world, not just right, the West, right. understand and ignore the terrible events that were unfolding in Europe? Well, you know, Frank, I, I, d I don't know either. Uh, I, like Tom Lentos, I was actually, you know, I was in high school and I was not old enough to be very sensitive or aware of those events as they were occurring. I have thought ever since that surely if the world had known, if civilized people, leaders in our country and, and our allies had known, they would have acted uh, you know, in a much more effective fashion than, than they did. And, and, uh, and yet, I have to say, I, you know, I don't really know. I think there's a, a couple of lessons we need to learn, though, from it. One is that the veneer of civilization and humanity is very thin mm. in our times as well as in the past. And we need to learn particularly about the, the dangers of political murder in our times. Uh, political murder in, you know, in the name of an ideology by a state by some kind of political movement, uh, I think that's very much with us. I believe, Frank, that the Holocaust s uh, reminds us that this is the most violent century in human history in which we're living just now, and that's surely one of the lessons. Yes. Yeah. Paula, as a student of history, um, I, one thing I'm grappling with is it seems to me that at places like the Evian Conference of 1938, the world did know there was adequate information that terrible misdeeds were either happening or about to happen as Hitler began to turn the screws on the Jews. And yet the response was universally that there's no refuge for the Jews. Is that a fair reading of history? Well, I think that there are several lessons to be learned from the Holocaust. The first being that the world cannot be standing on the sidelines and observing atrocities taking place and being mum. Uh, clearly, the burden and the weight of these atrocities ends up actually being on its shoulders and also the moral guilt uh, associated with it. Secondly, and maybe most specifically and related to your question, I think there was truly at that time tremendous disbelief mm -hmm. that something so fantastic and so heinous as this could have taken place. So naturally, uh, a human instinct that how could that even take place? Secondly, I believe that as part of the kind of information that was rendered at the time, there were disinformation campaigns and a blurring of, of, of lines. Finally, I think one of the most significant lessons is certainly that there's a need to not only take preemptive action when there's even the slightest tinge of evidence of such atrocities, no matter what the scale is, and secondly, certainly to uh, punish such perpetrators. Well, this, this comes back, of course, to present conditions and circumstances. And uh, Tom, the, the Bosnian case comes to mind. You've brought it forward yourself. Does this cry out for learning the lessons of the Holocaust? And if so, what are the policy prescriptions that you would be Well, making? the policy prescriptions were obvious a year and a half ago when a number of us uh, advocated publicly and privately to use the greatest military alliance extant on this planet, NATO, to prevent this nightmare from unfolding in the former Yugoslavia. There is nothing except the lack of political will 
that prevented George Bush and Cole and Mitterrand and Major and the Secretary General of NATO to call in Milosevic and tell him that if this is the Serbian the dictator. Serbian dictator that if in flak blood will flow there will be instantaneous and massive retaliation by NATO it is my judgment that had they done so there would have been no bloodshed because we are dealing with very intelligent people now we succeeded may, may I just ask on this though would the, would the point at which that threat should have been made have been when the line was crossed into Bosnia or when the line was first breached in Slovenia and subsequently Croatia? At the first step, yeah. at the first step. And I am convinced that just as deterrence worked against the mighty Soviet Union and its global armada of nuclear weapons and, and conventional weapons of vast proportions, obviously deterrence would have worked vis-a-vis -vis Milosevic but there was no political will. We would now be living in a new world order had the West acted. Ah, the new world order. Jane, you agree with this yes, in, in I, broad I, thrust. I, I, I Is agree. it a question of political will oh, absolutely. and a, a failure to learn that political will must be exhibited absolutely. early on? Let, you know, let me say that I, I, was, I read not long ago some dispatches from the Evian Conference in mm. 1938. This is very interesting, retrospectively, of course. This was the conference for Franklin Roosevelt right, convened exactly. to talk about the, talk about the fate of the Jews, the Nazi, what to right, do about the, the Nazi destruction of the Jews and what should be done about right. it. And, and a New York Times correspondent uh, wrote a very interesting dispatch in which he said the, the leaders of Britain and France and the United States had very carefully listened to the evidence and declined to raise the bidding mm -hmm. on the response. And they listened to the evidence, they left without raising the bidding, if you will, with not only without making any decisions, but without even seriously considering decisions which might have prevented the slaughter. I think, and you in know... In fact, it was worse than that, wasn't it? They, they declined to yes. offer refuge Oh, that's to right. the Jews that that's at that point Hitler right. was saying but that was he raising, would, he would that, was raising luxury ships that was to get raising rid of. that was raising the bidding you right. know that was raising the bidding uh, and, that and the signal that that sent to somebody like Hitler or just, uh, was the signal like sent to someone like Hitler was that uh, the elimination of Germany's Jews and Europe's Jews was basically up to him um, that was his goal to be rid of them and um, he had no reason to suppose anyone would mind, I think. That's the signal. And is that what we're facing today? People interpreting signals being sent by the civilized worlds in action in, in Bosnia and Somalia and Cambodia and elsewhere? Clearly we are witnessing an act of genocide okay. in Bosnia, very clearly. What is very striking, I believe, in all of the commentary mm -hmm. that you hear there's very little that has been said about the Genocide Convention and the relationship of genocide to the atrocities ongoing in Bosnia. Well, how could this be? This is an international legal document that was fashioned in 1948-49. It was ratified in the Reagan administration. By the um, United States. By the United States by many States other countries and by many other countries. Right. The term genocide is also an interesting one because there's been a misuse of the term, actually. Usually it is associated with uh, killings en masse. But actually, if you look at the convention, genocide uh, it connotes destruction of either in part or as a whole, um, uh, ethnic, racial, national, and religious entities, mm -hmm. and not just through killings. It can entail deportations. It can entail uh, uh, different types of torture and humiliation. But what are nations who subscribe to this convention supposed to do under its terms? Well, to seek to take preventive action and to punish. But not just wait until after it's done, actually intervene to prevent it from being done. That is a moral obligation, Frank, if you will, of the convention. Jane, please. Yes, but this just reminds us that what Thomas Hobbes understood in the 17th century, that is that words without swords are not uh, necessarily very useful. And the Genocide Convention, quite frankly, has uh, yet to demonstrate any utility of any kind in discouraging genocide or in helping to deal with it once it occurs. It, uh, conventions are all very well, in this, in the, but the fact is, words without swords, deterrence, you know, if collective security requires 
action. It requires not only political will, but it requires the will to act and then the action. And it requires credibility. I think Tom, may I just ask you on, on this, though? Yeah. One of the really signal developments, I thought, in the past year or so was when a gentleman by the name of George Kenney recently left the State Department, the Bush State Department, in protest over its policies towards Yugoslavia, former Yugoslavia. And he said at the time, a really rather extraordinary thing, he said that the administration was not seeking information about genocide or about death camps at the Serbians' hands for fear that in defining what was going on as genocide, it would be obliged under the terms of the convention to act. I mean, this is, this is taking even the meaning of words and, uh, and shredding them, let alone bringing to bear swords. Well, I think... Uh, have you well, followed this story? And I followed, does this give you concern? I followed the story. I've been to Yugoslavia many, many times over many decades, and I admired the, the young State Department officials' principled act in resigning. But I think it's probably true that when the history books are written from the vantage point of the year 2100, the failure to act in the former Yugoslavia will be perhaps the single greatest failure of the Bush administration. Here we were. But it is unfortunately continuing under the Clinton administration as well, is it not? Well, but I think there is a difference. And I tell you why I think there is a difference. There are certain moments in history when you can take certain action. And when those moments are gone, you cannot take typically the same action again. Agreed. You cannot unscramble an omelet. It would have been very, very different to tell Milosevic that ethnic cleansing and mass rape and the expulsion of hundreds of thousands is unacceptable. It is a very different thing to try to unravel this and sort of replay the, the missed history of the last 18 yeah. months. Yeah. Yes, I, well, I, I want to just, I want to turn to another subject, but before we do, let's uh, ask each of you, please, to say what you do with this set of scrambled eggs now in Bosnia as a, as a case in point. What should the Clinton administration be doing faced with genocide and faced with the options available to it? Paul? I just wanted to make the point and then to respond to your question, I do think Ambassador Kirkpatrick is exactly right. Uh, words don't count unless they're followed by action. In this case, my only reason for mentioning it is, is because there have been those who have denied that this is genocide taking place. Yes. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, the words do count. Uh, as to what can be done, I have a little bit of a difference with uh, the congressman, simply because I think you have individuals in Bosnia, the Bosnian Muslims, who are faced with a situation where peace, arbitration, reconciliation has not abated the aggression. They need to be armed, and I do think that is one of the solutions that That's should be... That's a step be that should be taken now. Tom, do you agree? Well, I have no objection to that, but I think realistically it's self-evident that this particular war is over. I think realism compels us to understand that. The Europeans will not engage in effective military action. We will not engage in military action by ourselves. The but time should we for let this them try to fight the fight themselves, the, the people on the ground, as much as you were uh, I, 50 I years am, ago? I am fully in favor of, of lifting it's, the arms. It's the least we can do. It is, but I don't think it is a solution to the realities on the ground. Gene, what should the Clinton administration do with these scrambled eggs? Well, it was a good thing that they began the food drops, and they should continue them in a more determined fashion. I think they should step that up, one. Two, they should, I think, uh, not only uh, act to remove the arms embargo, but actually to deliver arms. Uh, three, I think we should take out, using air power, I still think we should take out the heavy artillery around towns like Sarajevo and Srebrenica. Uh, which I are today bombing civilians. I think that's technically feasible, and I think it's uh, morally imperative, in fact. Good. Let me bring us from this sort of macro level of today's genocide and what we could be doing about it, should be doing about it, to a sort of micro example. The people most immediately affected, of course, by Hitler's Holocaust were the Jews, and this in turn gave rise to, in 1948, the creation of the State of Israel as a place that would assure that never again were the Jews faced with annihilation. 
Today, there are reasons to believe that from threats such as Saddam Hussein's Scud missiles, uh, Syria's chemical weapons, uh, Libya's chemical and biological weapons, Iraq's nuclear weapons, that the threat may yet persist of the annihilation of the state of Israel and the Jewish people. Is this a legitimate cause for concern at this point in the present world circumstances? Oh, I think it's extremely legitimate. I remember uh, giving a speech on the floor of the House uh, the morning after I heard that uh, Saddam Hussein threatened to burn half, half the state of Incinerate Israel. Incinerate. Incinerate Israel, yes. was the word. You're absolutely yes. correct. I think the Israelis probably have learned a lesson that being weak in this day and age is a formula for possible extermination. The lesson of um, Lebanon, uh, the killing fields of Pol Pot, what is happening in Bosnia, uh, are clear indications that uh, a country as exposed uh, as the State of Israel must have the capability to defend itself. Uh, Gene, well, on this question, though, it seems as though the present state of play in the so-called peace process is willingly or unwillingly designed to induce Israel to accept security risks, most especially risks perhaps that they might think we in the United States would offset through security guarantees. Mm. Is this a wise course for uh, Israel to be Let taking? me just say that Israel is, of course, not only the smallest country in the region, uh, but it is, it is a sliver of a country, literally. And Surrounded of all the countries by some in rather the region, unfriendly right, as well right, as large, exactly. it's large unfriendly uh, yeah. countries, unwilling to make peace with the state of Israel to this day. And whenever a leader has appeared like Sadat or Bashir Jamal, who was willing to make peace, they have been murdered by their compatriots. Um, so Israel's situation is very dangerous. I think that the that the lesson of Lebanon, the tragedy of Lebanon, demonstrates beyond any reasonable or even arguable doubt. What will happen to a small people uh, who are unable to defend themselves, quite frankly? And I think that uh, Israel, Israel should look closely at this lesson of Lebanon and of Bosnia and draw the conclusions. That's but is one of the conclusions not to rely upon others to pull your chestnuts out of the fire? I mean, I Golda Meir had, had, had the that. famous yeah. expression, I think, to Richard Nixon that the problem is by the time you get here, we won't be here. Right. Security guarantees and uh, territorial concessions and the like make sense to you? I think security guarantees can be very helpful as an adjunct to the ability of a small and beleaguered nation to defend itself. But they cannot be a substitute for their own ability to defend themselves. I agree. This I is agree a, with that too. A, a point on which we, uh, I think, have another interesting historical analogy. In fact, I would argue current American policy towards Israeli security calls to mind this parallel, in March of 1934, in a speech to the British Parliament, Winston Churchill made the following observation. He said, there is something to be said for isolation. There is something to be said for alliances. But there is nothing to be said for weakening the power with whom you would be in alliance, and then involving yourself more deeply in tangles in order to make it up to them. In that way, you have neither one thing or the other. You have the worst of both worlds. Well, I'm afraid we're at the end of our time. I want to thank you all very much for participating. Ambassador Gene Kirkpatrick, Congressman Tom Lantos, Paula Dobriansky, for your help in remembering the Holocaust and in understanding its lessons for today's world. Now for what we call famous last words. Here is what one of Sir Winston's most distinguished successors, Lady Margaret Thatcher, had to say on an earlier program of The World This Week concerning the international community's response to genocide in Bosnia. They've done a lot of things which may have relieved and helped a little, but they've done nothing effective to stop the brutality, to stop the ethnic cleansing which is taking place in their neighbor's territory. Nothing effective at all. That's what happens when you seek consensus, when you go by summary, instead of exercising clear leadership to do what you believe in. If we do not deal with the terrible brutalities that are taking place in Bosnia and the terrible ethnic cleansing, something I never thought to hear again in my lifetime, it will spread to other areas. Unless you deal with the terrible situation where we are now in Bosnia,
then it can spread from there to others and from there even further. Thank you for being a part of the world this week. Join us next week for a look at Communicating for Freedom. Is there a need for American free radios in the post-Cold War world? For all of us here, this is Frank Gaffney.